He would later write that he never questioned his government or his ideology until they threw him in prison. And even then, he said, it took him a while. Alexander Solzhenitsyn was born into a fairly wealthy Russian family, a wealthy landowner. They were cultured, edu educated. He seemed to be on the verge of an opportunity to enjoy a life of privilege in a place where it didn't always work that way. And then the Re Russian Revolution happened, and their country was turned upside down. His father died when he was very young, and then they took the lands that his father had, and they turned them over to the government, turned it into a communal farm. His mother went from being very wealthy to barely being able to put food on the table. But she scratched and she clawed for their survival, and she even managed to give Alexander Solzhenitsyn the education she wanted him to have and to raise him in the faith of her youth. But despite all her struggles, Alexander was a patriot. In World War II, he fought for the Red Army as a commander, and he fought valiantly, received two medals for it. When he saw the atrocities the Russian soldiers carried out upon the Nazi soldiers, he said they had it coming. When he witnessed the atrocities that they carried out upon the German people, he said it's payback for the atrocities the Nazis carried out upon them. And when he found out that his faith was undesirable, he gave that up too. He was all in. He believed in his country and what they were doing. Until one day he wrote in one private letter that he disagreed with some of the ways the government was conducting the war. He was arrested, thrown into prison with hardly a trial for eight years. And it was all forgotten. His devotion to their cause and ideology, forgotten. His faithful service in the military, his two medals, forgotten. Everything he had given up for them, even his Christian faith, forgotten. He stared at the world from inside that prison, out those bars, and he faced what it means to live underneath the thumb of a tyrant. When he was sick, they wouldn't let him get medical attention. He almost died. When he was let out, they still wouldn't let him re-enter society. They put him in exile. It'd be over a decade before he'd re-enter society because of what he wrote in one letter. He would do more writing than that, though. He wrote a book called The Gulag Archipelago, this mammoth, multi-volume work where he talked about what it was to live in the Russian Gulag system. It stands to this day as a reminder of just how tyrannical a government can be. But the Apostle Peter, his experience with his government was even worse than that. Remember, it was his local government that arrested Jesus put him on trial, and crucified him. It was his local government that when they found out that the apostles were telling people Jesus rose, brought them in and told them to stop or there'd be consequences. It was his local government who arrested some from their number and put them to death. And the Roman government? They took persecuting Christians to a whole other level. At some points, even rounding them up, putting them in arenas, and watching them be torn apart by wild animals or butchered by gladiators. The Emperor Nero even took them and paled them, lit them on fire, used them as lanterns in his garden. Appalling things. And Peter? Peter was arrested and crucified by that government. So in our sermon text, we hear Peter talk about government, and what do you expect? Do you expect him to talk about how it's good to obey the government until they get a little too tyrannical, in which case you take the power away and give it to the people? Do you expect to hear him talk about upending the social order and flipping things on its head? Exactly the opposite. He has a very simple command. Submit. You read from 1 Peter chapter 2. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority whether to the emperor as a supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. 
Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. His command is simple. Submit. It means to line yourself up under. It means to submit your will to the will of the one who's above you. It means to be where you're called to be. There's so many things about that that rub me the wrong way. When I was a kid, every game I played said, if you submitted, you lost. We even have a game called Submit. Did you ever play it? Where you take both your hands and you'd interlock them with the other person's hands and you try to bend their hands back to a point that it got so painful, in order to make you let go, what did you have to say? Submit. It meant you lost. In a brief lapse of judgment in high school, I went out for the wrestling team. And my particular style was to get manhandled by my opponent, thrown to the mat inside of 10 seconds, and spend the rest of the time trying not to submit. I was unsuccessful every time. Submit. For me, when I was a kid, it always meant to lose. But my sinful nature? It hates that term even more. Because if we were to look at our black sinful nature and we were to break it down to what it really is, one of its defining characteristics is that it has a ruthless God complex. It wants to control everything it can control in whatever area of life it's able to control it. It always wants my will to be done first and foremost. I mean, ultimately, every sin is a power play. Whether you're doing what you shouldn't be doing or taking what you shouldn't be taking, it's always about me getting what I want. And so submit. I mean, it's not just countercultural. It runs completely against the very fabric of my sinful nature. But of all people, submit to them. He doesn't tell us to submit to the America of our youth. He doesn't tell us to submit to the America of our ideals or our dreams, to a world and a government where we always agree with everything they do and everything they do is just and right, where we can always respect every leader that's elected. He's not telling us to submit to an illusion, but to submit to our government as it is with liberals whose ideas you think are nuts, with conservatives who you think are completely out of touch, with all of its scandals and all of its conspiracies and all of its dirty politics. He says, submit. We don't have to like them. And we don't have to agree with everything they do. And we dare not take part in their sins. But we do owe them our respect, our service, our honor. What a struggle that is, huh? Because it's so easy to use our freedom as a cover-up for evil. You see, my simple nature is good at keeping score. I don't know about yours. But it's real good at noticing all the different mistakes that our government makes and just stacking those mistakes on top of each other until I get this soapbox I can stand on and I can decry all of their evils and all of their faults. And there's nothing wrong with that. As Americans, we have the right to do that. That's one of the beautiful things of our country. We have the freedom of speech. But boy, we can do it in such a disrespectful way that even the mudslingers in Washington wouldn't go as far as we go sometimes. We can say things they wouldn't even run on the commercials we see all the time this time of year. It's amazing how our sinful nature can take those mistakes and not only use them as a soapbox upon which we can mudsling our, to our heart's delight, but then as justification for me failing to do what I know I should do. Failing to be the citizen I know I should be. Failing to pay the taxes I know I should pay. Failing to offer the service I know I should offer. Using our freedom as a cover-up for evil. And all oh, we can talk a good game, huh? We're good at giving justifications for this or for that and explaining it. But honestly, ask yourself, is our offense so much about our righteous anger 
Or is it about that black God complex within that never, ever wants to submit our will to anything else, even God's? You know, it's interesting. In our first lesson, the Apostle Paul tells us that our governing authorities are there to do us good. According to church history, do you know what happened to Paul? He was led outside of the city by that same government and beheaded. Peter says that our governing authorities are there to punish the evildoer and reward the one who does good. According to church history, do you know what happened to Peter? He was crucified upside down by that government. You see, no one wants to serve a tyrant. And while God intended governments to do us good, they don't always do a good job of that. And they fall short time after time. But you know, even if everything you love about being an American were taken away tomorrow, even if all your freedoms were stripped for you and everything you feared would happen did happen, you would still be free. You see, it's amazing when we consider our dual citizenship, not only in our earthly government, but also in our heavenly kingdom. And Peter appeals to that in our sermon text. Look at what he says. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as a supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it's God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people. But do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. You and I are Americans. And as Americans, on the 4th of July, we have an opportunity to thank God for all the freedoms we enjoy being citizens of this great country. But here, remember, he's not just talking to Americans. He's talking to people in Peter's day who lived beneath a tyrannical government. He's talking to an Alexander Solzhenitsyn who found his faith again inside the Russian gulag and looked out at the world from inside bars. Do you see what he calls us? He calls us free. Because while you and I are Americans, we're also a member of a different kingdom, a heavenly one, that gives us freedoms that no government on earth has a right to give and no government on earth can possibly take away. Because your children not of a heavenly dictator, but a heavenly father. Think of it, that is how he treats you, isn't it? I mean, how did you get here this morning? Did God pull you up out of bed, put you in a headlock, and drag you along, creaking and screaming? Or did he come to you in the power of his word? Did he win your heart so that you love him like he loves you? You have eternal life, a place with God in heaven, membership in his family, forgiveness of sins, resurrection from the dead, promise after promise. How did you get those promises? Does he hold those in front of you like a carrot leading the horse telling you you can have those things if you do the right things? Or did he just hand it over to you for free by grace? And now that you live as a Christian, as you've run through this series on the Ten Commandments, what have you seen? Are they just hoops he wants you to jump through just because we can watch you squirm? Or does every commandment protect a different blessing from God? In the fourth commandment, he doesn't tell you to respect governing authorities just because he likes to watch us squirm, but because it's what's best for us. It makes us good citizens, good neighbors, good employees, and even tyrants like that. You see, it carries with it inherent blessings. But no blessing is as great as the freedom that you have as a Christian. Because it's a freedom that exists on a completely different plane. 
You're free from guilt because you paid the price for your sin. You're free from the temptation that haunts you because you know that if your sin is taken away, the devil has no hold on you anymore. You're free from the fear of death because you know that just as Jesus rose, you will too. You are free from the fear of what happens in the next election because you know that your future does not rest in the hand of one party or another or one candidate or another, but in the hand of a God who created heavens and earth and stands above it all. You're free. And he has set you free to serve. Because whether we get it or not, that is what freedom is. We have such a backwards view of freedom sometimes, don't we? I mean, if someone came to you and told you you could do anything you wanted without any consequence, isn't it funny how instantly your mind goes to something sinful, something shameful, something you shouldn't do? Our sinful nature is great at jumping in, taking the reins, and trying to lead us back into the sin that God freed us from. You see, God has set you free so you could be what you were made to be. To serve as he's called you to serve. Because those commands he gives us are good, and they are right, and they are beneficial for you and the people around you. And boy, is it powerful when Christians use their freedom to serve. Because there's never been a time where culture had all that high a view of us as Christians. In Peter's day, do you know what they said about Christians? They said they were subversive, that they were going to upend the social order, accused them of being cannibals and all kinds of terrible things. In Alexander Solzhenitsyn's day, do you know what they said about Christians? They said religion was the opiate for the masses. It was useless, not the kind of thing a modern man needed. Are the reviews today any better? But boy, is it powerful when Christians use their freedom to serve. Because in a few months, we're going to watch as the same thing happens that always happens. And tribalism takes over in our culture and, and one side attacks another in the midst of the election. And it is going to be so powerful for a Christian to be the only one in the room who's not yelling. To be able to talk about the issues honestly, to be open about our opinions and our ideas, and yet to know the person we're talking to isn't our adversary, but a blood-bought soul of Christ. As Peter says, that silences the talk of the ignorant and the foolish. And it shows people the power of the freedom we have in Christ. We're going to watch as once again our culture gets polarized as each side claims absolute truth. But as Christians, isn't it nice to be free to know the difference between opinion and the Word of God? To be able to analyze those things according to our Christian common sense, to have our own views, and yet to know there's a difference between what I view to be a good policy and what God says in His Word. If we can keep that balance, we can silence the talk of ignorant and foolish men. And we can show people the power of the freedom we have in Christ. You know, one side wins and one side loses. That's how it goes. But as Christians, the sky isn't falling either way. Because our future does not rest in the hands of a party or a candidate, but in the hands of a God who created heaven and earth. He's just simply above that all. To be able to approach that without fear... It silences the talk of ignorant and foolish people. And it shows the power of the freedom that we have in Christ. I mean, I'll be honest with you, election time is not my favorite thing. I don't love the commercials, not a fan of all the phone calls of people knocking on my door. But there's quite an opportunity for us there. An opportunity for us to be good, God-fearing citizens, to be open and honest about the things we want to talk about, but to do so with an understanding that's ours in Christ. Next week, we celebrate the 4th of July. It's one of my favorite holidays. I always like it. It's an opportunity to be thankful for all the ways that God blesses us in our country. And it, it, it's a time to also maybe think about some of the things we don't like. Which is fine. This is a part of what we're thankful for as Americans. We have the right to opinions, the right to free speech, the opportunity to vote and to protest and all the rest. But even if you woke up tomorrow and all of that was gone, 
Even if you woke up tomorrow and you were sitting next to Alexander Solzhenitsyn in a Russian gulag, even if you woke up tomorrow and you couldn't worship in a church like this, but like the people in Peter's day, you had to worship underground and hide, even if every freedom you love about our country were taken away from you tomorrow, you would still have a freedom they can't touch. You'd still have a future that is completely secure in the hands of your Heavenly Father. You'd still have citizenship in the kingdom of your Heavenly Father who loves you. You see, no matter what happens, you're free. Free to serve. Amen.